part um, is going to cover the first part of Module 15, which is what we would have covered last Tuesday in class um, that we missed um, so that we don't get behind and can stay on the schedule that we were supposed to follow. So um, Module 15 covers plant physiology um, and reproduction. And We'll be doing reproduction next week, so um, this week this video is going to focus on the physiology part of that. And the word physiology just means function. Um, so plant physiology just means plant function, or what are the things that plants do? Um, they are living. They are living things. So what are things that plants do that? Um, that are related to its function. Okay, so we're gonna start by talking about water because you know that water is necessary for plants to live. Um, we're gonna talk about four ways that plants use water and these functions of plants would not take place um, unless there are unless there's water available. So the first one is photosynthesis. I'm just going to list all four and then we'll talk about each one. The second is called trigger pressure. The third is called hydrolysis. And the fourth one uh, is just transportation. Okay, so again, four functions of plants that require water. So we're just going to work our way through this list now. So we will start um, with photosynthesis. So um, photosynthesis is, uh, the process of photosynthesis is carbon dioxide. Plus water, so there's where our water comes in. Will give, uh, gives, um, of course this requires sunlight, but it gives glucose. So this oxygen is supplied to um, animals for breathing, and the glucose is the food for the plant. And we borrow from, when we eat plants, we're uh, eating this food, but as long as a plant continues to live, it's using this glucose um, as its food. So as you can see, water is necessary for photosynthesis to take place, um, and the plants need that water to make uh, food for themselves in the form of glucose. So that's the first process that plants do that requires water. The second one is, is something that is called trigger pressure. And we will study plant cells um, in more detail um, in a few weeks, but um, plant cells, uh, most animal cells are kind of oval shaped but plant cells are more rectangular shape. Um, and the main thing I want you to know about now in a plant cell is there is a structure in a plant cell that is called a central vacuole. And um, 
what that central vacuole does is that it fills with water. And it does that by a process that is called osmosis. And all that osmosis is, is something moving from an area where there is a lot of it to an area where there's uh, less of it. So we, we say that osmosis is something moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So if a plant cell um, has, is, is in an environment where there is a lot of water around it, then that water will move into the plant cell and specifically that water moves into this central vacuole and it fills, the water will fill this central vacuole. As the, as the water fills that central vacuole, it will become larger, it will swell, and uh, eventually the pressure that is created by that water will push uh, against the walls of the plant, the, the, well, the walls of the plant cell, and that pressure pointing, pushing against the walls of the plant cell is trigger pressure, and it is the reason that plants stay upright. If without trigger pressure, um, plants would just flop over, their stems would not be upright, they would just flop over um, and be all uh, wilted. So in fact, when you see a plant that's wilted, it means that um, it needs water so that that water can move into the central vacuole and provide that pressure against the walls of the plant cell so that the stiffness returns to the stem of the plant. Okay, so that is turbo pressure. Okay, um, the next thing that we will talk about, the next process, the third one on our list is hydrolysis. So what hydrolysis is, is breaking large molecules down into smaller molecules by adding water. So in the word hydrolysis, you can see this word hydro, which means water. So we're just taking a large molecule, breaking it down into something smaller by adding water. So why would hydro why is hydrolysis an important function of plants? Okay, remember we said in photosynthesis that the food that the, the plants make during photosynthesis is glucose. And glucose is a monosaccharide. And that's a big word, but um, mono means one, and saccharide just means sugar. So basically it's just one uh, sugar um, molecule um, is a monosaccharide. So glucose is the 
Um, it is in the form of glucose that plants use glucose, use sugar. Okay, so plants use glucose. That's how they get their energy. However, um, when a plant stores its energy, it stores it as something that is called a polysaccharide. So it stores energy as a polysaccharide. So the plant makes it as glucose, but if it doesn't use that glucose right away, then it stores it and uses it later. But the form in which it stores it is a polysaccharide. Poly, poly just means many. So in other words, it links together many monosaccharides, two or more monosaccharides to make a polysaccharide. Then when it needs to use that stored energy, it, it needs to break it back down into a monosaccharide, and that process requires water. So, um, and that process is called hydrolysis. So it's taking a, mon a polysaccharide, adding water, and then um, in the chemical process, polysaccharide plus water will break it down into a monosaccharide, and that is the form of glucose that the plant can actually use. Polysaccharide is just the storage form of the sugar for the plant. Okay, then the last process is called, we will just call transportation. And um, for this, remember that we said that plants have a xylem. Um, and we said that uh, the xylem carries water. And in the water is are dissolved minerals. So plants need water and they need minerals to perform the different functions that they do. And that water gets absorbed from the environment, um, mostly through the roots of the plant. And then the xylem transports that water and the minerals that are dissolved in it throughout the plants. Um, in addition to that, um, there is a, another um, another process that uh, is related. It, it's still transportation, but we give it a, a separate word that is called translocation. Um, and, and this involved translocation involves the flowing. So remember the flowing is the living tissue that transports things. So um, most of the um, food that the plant makes is going to be made by the leaves of the plant, but the, the roots and the stems also, the roots of the plant and the stem of the plant also need those nutrients. So by a process called translocation, um, the nutrient, the, the glucose that was made in the leaves goes into the phloem and it gets transported then to the roots and the stems. Um, so remember the phloem is tissue, it's, it's alive, the phloem is dead tissue, but the phloem is living tissue and um, this process of translocation actually requires energy um, to transport the nutrients from the leaves to the roots and the stem. 
And so because the phloem is living tissue, it is able to use, it's able to expend energy to get um, those nutrients to the roots and the stem. So um, again, it, it, it's a process requiring water because those nutrients, um, the glucose and other nutrients besides minerals are transported in the phloem dissolved in water. Okay, so those are the four ways that, um, or the four processes, the four functions that plants do that require water. Um, now, how does water move in plants? So water, let's talk about water transport in plants. And the way that water moves in a plant um, is called the cohesion tension theory. is based on, you'll learn more about this if you take chemistry, but this theory is based on the fact that water molecules are strongly attracted to each other and they like to stay together. So um, even if there is tension, even if there's something that's trying to pull those water molecules away from each other, they are cohesive they will um, try to stay together. And it has to do with the way a water molecule is made and the charges that are on the water molecule. But um, the basic idea is that water molecules will, um, they're attracted to each other and they will stay close together. So if you, th if you think back to when we learned about the microscopic structure of a leaf, um, so we had these different parts of the leaf, but we had this opening that was called a stoma. And remember that that stoma opens and closes to let air in, but when the stoma, op when the stoma is open, um, water is able to leave the leaf. So water is able to leave the leaf when the stoma is open. So you may remember that we said that like right now in this time of year, um, Plants are trying to preserve water because we're heading into winter. And so the stoma um, closes um, so that it can uh, hold on to that water. But then with the stoma closed, then you're not getting the air, that you're not getting the carbon dioxide through there that um, is necessary for photosynthesis. And so um, eventually the leaf will die and uh, it falls off. That's what we see happening um, in fall as we head into winter. So here's what happens. Um, if you think of a, if you think of a leaf, let me draw the veins on this leaf. And let's think about the stoma of that leaf being open. So the stoma is open. So when the stoma is open, that allows water to um, evaporate from the leaf. So water evaporates from the leaf.
And so now what we say about that now is that there, once that happens, then there is a deficit, there's a water deficit in that leaf. In other words, the, there is a, um, you've taken some water out of the supply of that leaf and so it's missing some. So there's a deficit of water. So in order to, um, in order to fix that water deficit, um, a water molecule, so this leaf is attached to some plant, you know, so there's other leaves attached to it, um, and then there's roots that go down into the soil. Um, so in order to, to fix this water deficit that resulted from water evaporating, a water molecule will start, will move up through the roots and into the stem of the plant. So you'll have a water molecule <coughs> moving up here, trying into this leaf to replace the water that was lost by evaporation. Well, because of because those wa because water molecules like to stay together, when one mo water molecule starts to move up that stem. Others are going to follow, and they will just stay right. They like to stay close to each other, so they'll just stay right close to each other. And that, as, as that water moves up, then um, other water molecules will follow, um, so that they replace the water. Any time the water that is being lost by evaporation will be replaced by these water molecules moving up through the roots and the stem. So, um, how does that relate to the fungus? We know that we know the plant needs water. Um, the reason that this is important is that anything that is dissolved in that water will also be cared. So, if there's minerals or um, sugar or whatever else is dissolved in that water, um, that's as as the water moves up into the leaves, whatever they are carrying will also be moved with it. Okay, so that whole prize called cohesion tension theory. So again, that, that cohesion just means that water molecules will stay together. So when this, when the water evaporates and you create this deficit, that's that creates a tension that will pull water, pull, pull a water molecule up. One mo water molecule starts to move and then the others will follow because of the um, tension, the, because of the cohesion that exists between water molecules. Okay, so those are the four uh, processes that um, require water um, in order for plants to perform their functions. Um, let's talk a little bit about the growth of plants. And you might remember um, from the last chapter that um, growth of plants takes place in the meristematic tissue. So it is there that um, plants uh, that plant cells do divide or mul multiply, and, and uh, we call that mitosis. But one of the things that that regulates the growth of plants are some chemicals that are called hormones, and. Um, I want to mention several. Um, the three that I'll mention, I think three. Uh, actually, I'll mention four. Um, the first ones are called the auxins. These are all hormones, which are just chemicals that are produced by plants. Um, we humans have um, different hormones that are are produced by our body to form certain perform. Um, certain functions. So there's auxins, and the big thing I want you to remember about auxins is they help to regulate 
um, the length of a plant. So in other words, how long do the stems of a plant get? Okay, so that's one. Um, a second hormone are called the uh, gibberlins. Gibberellins, I guess I should have said gibberellins. Um, and these, these hormones are involved in like the flowering parts of the plant. So the seed, um, the buds, and the flowers, they help those to grow. Um, I guess I will only. Um, I guess I will only uh, ask you to know three of these. The third one that I want to mention is ethylene. Okay, I'm going to hold on to that one. So these are the three I want you to know, and we'll come back. I'm going to say a few more about this. Three more things about this one and this one. Okay, so um, let's start with the auxins. So again, they're hormones that regulate growth. But besides the hormones that regulate, besides this hormone auxin that regulates the length or how tall a stem gets, um, there are some other things that kind of interact with the hormones. And um, so we get three processes. One is called phototropism. And phototropism is that plants grow in response to light. So that this word photo means light. So um, there's a figure in your book. Um, it is figure 15.3. Uh, actually, actually, uh, let's see, which one do they show? I guess they don't, they don't actually show phototropism in your book. But um, you probably you all have probably seen a plant. If you, if you put a plant near a window, the stem of that plant will bend and it will grow toward the light. Um, and then if you uh, want, it, want the plant to grow um, and straighten out, you have to turn the plant, and then, it, then that side of the plant will go, grow toward the light. So... The grow, the, when plants grow toward the light, um, that is called phototropism. Um, and then a second thing that plants do is called gravitropism. So you probably see grava in there. Um, so this is the growth of plants in response to gravity. So plants know which way is up and they know which way is down. So they they respond to gravity. And if you um, if you place a plant upside down, it will grow upward. It will seek and it will grow upward. So it will grow against gravity. And there is a figure in your book, figure 15.3, that shows um, a plant that has been placed on its side. And um, and that plant will the stem of the plant will grow um, so that it is upright. And um, in that figure, you, you it also you, the figure points out where the oxen hormones are in that stem. So gravitropism is the growth of a plant stem in response to gravity. And then the last one is called thigmatropism. And 
and um, this is the growth of plants in response to touch. So this is um, where plants will wrap around whatever they touch um, and the, the leaves will point away from what it is growing on. So we've all seen ivy growing on the side of, sides of buildings or um, beans, for example, will when they make contact with a, um, a trellis or a fence, they will grow up that fence. Those are all examples of phototropism. It's regulated by these hormones that are called auxins, but the plant will grow in um, in response to touch, and that is called uh, phototropism. Okay, um, we've said that um, plants get their food um, from the soil and they get their nutrients, the nutrients that they need um, from the soil and it gets transported um, up through the stem of the plant. Um, but um, there are some plants that are called insectivorous plants or or sometimes these are called carnivorous plants um, because they eat carnivores, okay? Um, or they consume um, carnivores. So an insectivorous plant, and the, the reason carniv carnivorous plant is a better um, term than insectivorous is um, it's not always insects because there are some plants that will consume small mammals like mice or moles. So um, carnivore, carnivorous plant is a, um, is a better description. Now, you might wonder whether carnivorous plants do photosynthesis, and the answer is yes. Um, they still do photosynthesis, and in fact, they still get um, their energy from photosynthesis. They still get their food from photosynthesis. So then why do they eat um, insects or small mammals if they still do photosynthesis? Well, the reason they eat uh, insects or small mammals is that these um, carnivorous plants um, typically grow in parts of the world where the soil is lacking something that the plant needs. And often what the soil is lacking is something called ammonia. And so by, um, by consuming um, insects or small mammals, the plant gets the ammonia that it needs in order to um, to do not only to do photosynthesis but to do the other processes that the plants require. So in other words, the, plant, the plants can't get all of the materials that they need from the soil um, and so they will digest um, insects or small mammals to get those. We, next week we will watch a video um, of some types, uh, some examples of these carnivorous plants. I, I, I won't have you watch that video now, but we'll, we'll start class next week by, by watching a small video. Okay, um, I want to stop today by um, just saying a few things. Since we're going to do reproduction next week, um, I want to kind of set the table for discussing reproduction of plants. So um, plants, so remember the two types of reproduction are sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. And next week we're going to learn about 
sexual reproduction that involves a male and female, and egg and um, sperm for uh, reproduction, but plants can also reproduce asexually. So I just want to talk a little bit about the ways that a plant can reproduce asexually, and then we'll deal with sexual reproduction next week. Okay, so asexual reproduction. Some of these you've probably uh, seen and you just haven't thought about them uh, in terms of what they mean in terms of a plant's reproduction. So uh, what are some of the ways that plants can um, reproduce asexually? Um, One way is that um, sometimes the leaves um, that grow on a plant can reach down into the soil and those leaves will grow into new plants. So there are some types of plants that can reproduce in that way. Uh, this is asexual reproduction, so the, the baby plants will look exactly like the adult plants. Um, sometimes there are underground stems. The underground stems or roots, um, or the underground stems in the roots of a plant will... Um, grow into new plants. So an example of this, um, and this will grow into new plants. Um, an example of this would be uh, if you ever planted mint, um, you can plant one mint plant and in a couple years um, you will have all of the mint that you ever wanted um, because the, um, there's these underground stems in, a, um, in the roots of a mint plant that will grow into new plants. Another way that plants can reproduce asexually is by runners that are above the ground. So above the ground runners. And I think your book has a picture of this. Um, yeah, in figure 15.5 in your book. So a, a classic example of a um, plant that sends out runners is a strawberry plant. So these are above the ground. Um, and the, they, these, there are like stems that are above the ground that uh, eventually get too heavy and they touch the ground and then that forms new roots and it forms new plants. Um, and then the last one I'll mention um, in this discussion is uh, there are some plants that you can, um, maybe you've, you've seen something called stem cutting, where you can just cut a piece of the stem of a plant and place it in soil and it will grow into a new plant. This can happen naturally too. So if the stem breaks and bends and then touches the ground, that can, that, um, broken stem can produce roots and it can grow into new plants. But often people will just do this themselves. They'll um, cut a stem from a plant, stick it into soil, and it will grow into a new plant. So those are all ways that plants can reprodu reproduce asexually. The offspring, the baby plants, would look exactly like the parent plant, and it doesn't require... Um, uh, an egg and a sperm or, you know, an egg and pollen 
for um, for that reproduction to take place. Okay, then the last thing I'll mention, and we're going to watch a video about this next week also, is something called grafting. Um, and what you do in grafting is that you cut a stem from one plant and attach it to another. So often the way that new varieties of um, fruit are made um, are, is by grafting. So um, there are still new varieties of apples being um, developed. And what they will do is they will take um, stems from one type of apple um, plant and they will attach it to another type of apple plant and they're trying to like maximize the desirable qualities that they want in an apple. So it might be sweetness or it might be um, tartness depending on what they're trying to develop or it might be you know a soft apple or a hard apple but they will um, graft one type of apple onto another um, to get a new um, a new variety of an apple and this is done with other fruits as well. Um, next week we're, uh, we're going to watch a video about a man who um, has um, been working on developing a tree that will produce 40 different kinds of fruit. Um, so it's a fascinating video and we'll watch that during class next week. Okay, so that's all I have for the first part of module um,